first question is for Lee. Peter spoke about the developments in the EU for factory farm animals. To recap, those were the ban on sow stalls, battery cages, veal crates, the creation of the category for animals as sentient beings, and the debate on cloning of farm animals, as well as um, <coughs> the World Trade Organisation rules, but specifically um, we'll stick to those five I mentioned. In your opinion, and from a federal perspective, is it conceivable that the leg legislative changes Peter has spoken about can occur here? And if so, how do you conceive the best way to achieve those changes? Look, uh, I think yeah, most definitely yes. It's a very, very big yes, and I, I always feel very confident. But after uh, the enormous concern that we've seen expressed uh, by the public over the live exports, it just gives me great more encouragement. And I do acknowledge that there's been a setback this week. The live exports have been resumed, but uh, the, the, the word is out there. And I think we do need to feel very positive about that and build on what we've seen uh, in this short period. Uh, now, these um, speeches that we've heard tonight have set out some of the um, problems uh, that we have when the law gets involved, but we know that there is a point where the law does need to get involved, and so often it doesn't go as far as we would like, and we have this particular problem within Australia where these codes uh, can really um, limit and become a real block on... Um, what I saw, saw at State Parliament, and I imagine Kate's coming up against this too, where you're in a real dilemma. You're there as a lawmaker to try and improve the laws uh, that come before Parliament, uh, but we <coughs> often were receiving advice from the animal rights and animal welfare groups that these codes would, um, in many ways, make things worse for the animals uh, in, particularly in terms of, obviously, they're keeping their rights and their welfare, but in terms of actually advancing the law to consolidate that protection. So there are complexities here, but when you look at the um, whole issue of progressive change for all of us in this society and for animals, it comes from people's actions. The law catches up. Uh, we saw that in terms of women's rights in protecting the environment, occupational health and safety. People are out there working hard for that with pickets, with protests, with people being arrested. And we're seeing that the same with animals. And I think Peter's speech reminded us of that tonight. So I'm a great believer we're getting there. We just need more of that action, more of that pressure. We've got a lot to feel positive about. OK, well, that's <laughs> good to hear. Thank you, Lee. Uh, my next question is for Kate. Some very similar question to Lee's, but I would like um, if you could answer it, um, oh, sorry. If you could answer it from a state perspective, so is it conceivable that the legislative changes Peter has spoken about can occur here? Um, and if so, how do you conceive the best way to achieve those changes? Thank you, Ruth. And I must say, it, it is um, it is great to actually be on a panel with a um, with another Greens. Uh, normally, of course, we're a token Greens yes. on a panel, and it's. Uh, I have to say, it is great for us um, both to have the animal welfare portfolio and both to be on a panel. I think that's a, that's a pretty good thing. Um, I would be looking federally at this point in time for uh, a reform in uh, animal welfare rights or, or, or animal law or uh, anything in relation to animal welfare. We've got a quite a conservative um, government, if you haven't noticed already, that um, at a state level that is um, has done a number of um, deals with the Shooters and Fishers Party, and as we're seeing recently, obviously, with the Christian Democrats as well, but I don't think that is as relevant um, to, this, to this audience. I think, obviously, with the Greens in the balance of power federally now for the next six years, or three, three at least, um, we have, uh, I would think, more opportunity that, there than at, the, than at the state level. I know that many of you in the room would have followed um, animal law reform in New South Wales over the last 10 years and it has been slow and any steps that have been made have been very, very small. For example, you know, the very small increase in the um, size um, for cage tens, you know, now the size of an A4 paper or something. My colleague John Kay is looking at um, introducing a private member's bill on truth in labelling laws to deal with some of the labelling around, um, obviously, um, free range eggs, which will be very good. 
However, that's a private member's bill and I really doubt uh, at this stage with the political situation that that will actually get passed. Um, we find, we're finding at the moment that just very, very sensible, really common sense stuff uh, that, that the Greens are suggesting and, and the opposition for that matter are um, being blocked. So any campaign, as you all know, who have been campaigning on animal welfare um, reform and animal rights for many, many years know that it's a very long campaign. I would look at this in New South Wales for, for any substantial changes to be five to ten years in terms of that campaign. And as Lee said, the, the, the public sentiment out there right now for changes to this is very real. I just don't think the state government at this point in time would listen to that very much. As a Greens MP in the State Parliament for Animal Welfare, I'm prepared to introduce various bills on animal, um, animal welfare, even on animal rights, even to push that a bit and, you know, start the debate, which I think is really important. In fact, the debate has started, but to help the debate, I should say. But I really think that the, the campaign is not, unfortunately, to be brutally honest, at the New South Wales level, really, for the next um, four years. We need to think very strategically. Um, we need to think if we're going to use Parliament, it's, it's going to just be for a little bit of publicity. It's not going to be for real reform for the next four years. But, you know, maybe um, federally actually is the way to focus, you know, the, on the model codes of practice and various things. What I, I'll finish on this. What I um, uh, do want to say is that when Greens get into power sharing roles, Greens in government, balance of power, whatever, really substantial changes are made. I think it was um, the Greens in Germany. Um, in the late 90s that got um, animals into the constitution in that country um, in their power sharing arrangements. So that was significant, obviously, in terms of animal rights. And I, I think we, we um, the more Greens have influence in Parliament, I think the, the more we'll see, to be blunt, um, in terms of uh, animal um, welfare change in animal rights. Could you possibly, obviously, um, sorry to lean in front of you. Um, obviously in respect, you spoke about New South Wales um, and we have the problem with the Shooters and Fishers Party here having the balance of power for the State Parliament. Um, is it possible for you to comment on other states or should I? Uh, it's a bit tough for it's me tough. to comment on okay. other states, I must leave. Um, see what's happened in Tasmania, for example. Um, in Tasmania, um, and, well, Victoria, there's certainly a problem. Uh, the coalition have control of both houses, and I think that that's a real setback for the democratic process, uh, and it makes it much harder to push forward with the reform. Uh, and we still see that duck shooting uh, is occurring in that state, and it's just so much harder to um, get the changes that we needed. So um, I think there has been some more positive developments in Western Australia. The Greens have been in balance of power there. Unfortunately, in Queensland, we don't have an upper house, uh, and therefore the chances of getting this public dialogue going is more limited. Okay. Thank you, Lee. Um, just wondering if any of the other panellists would like to comment on either of those two questions. Nope. Okay, very good. My next question is for Dana. Dana, how do the developments that Peter spoke about compare with the situation in the US? So you've given the Australian perspective. Um, obviously, I would like to utilise your US expertise on this point. <coughs> Uh, the U.S. and Australia are similar in a number of respects. First of all, that uh, in the U.S. there is also not much federal legislation for animal welfare. And, and the places where it does include animals, uh, <clears throat> such as in its humane, its Federal Humane Slaughter Act, it again contains exemptions that exclude 90 percent of the animals that are slaughtered, the, the poultry. So um, even at the federal level where animals are mentioned, the, the particular ones most affected are excluded from the protections there. Um, as, as here, cruelty laws in the U.S. are also administered at the state level, and nearly all states exempt farm animals from their cruelty protections. 
What's different in the states than here is the ballot measure process, which you may have heard about over here. Um, in the U.S., citizens have the ability to gra gather signatures for a petition and present that to the local elections council to have a measure uh, put on the ballot. It could be uh, in Oregon, where I lived, we had 150 measures on the ballot for one election. It's a little bit cumbersome. Usually there's only four or five in election. But what this does is it, is it gets things on the ballot for a vote where legislators either don't think they have the, the clout or the votes or even the political motivation to move this um, to a legislative vote through the legislative process. So it allows the, the citizens to come in and basically what, what Lee was talking about, citizen demand and, and a push by the citizenry to get something in front of the voters where their politicians have failed to do so in the legislative process. That's something that's unique to America. And it is, in fact, the way that most advances in animal welfare have been pushed through in the U.S., particularly within the last decade. It's through that ballot initiative process. So, for example, since 2002, seven states there have banned sow stalls, and all of those were through the ballot measure process there, not through the legislature. You may have heard that in 2008, California passed its Proposition 2, again, another ma ballot measure put on the ballot by the people who organize and, and get the minimum number of sin signatures to get it on the ballot. Um, I don't, I'm not sure why the legislature didn't take this up themselves because as it turns out, it, it garnered 63% of the voters in favor of getting rid of the, the worst three practices of factory farming, which are veal crates, sow stalls, and battery cages, all will be phased out in California as of 2015. A year after that, tail docking was banned in California. A number of other states have continued to ban veal crates, and the battles at the ballot boxes continue but are now gaining some momentum. In other developments in the U.S., uh, again, we see the largest pork and veal producers in the U.S., Smithfield Foods and Strauss Meats, the industry seeing the writing on the wall and announcing they're going to voluntarily phase out the use of gestation and veal crates. And again, as of 2010, that's happened, um, at least as far as veal crates. Gestation crates for pigs are still a battle. Just last month in July, the egg laying industry came together with animal groups to hammer out an agreement for better treatment of egg laying hens, but unfortunately without banning egg uh, battery cages altogether. Uh, disturbingly, there's been a trend in the U.S. recently to promote what's called ag gag rules, which is agriculture gagging <laughs> rules where the industries have been able to get their own measures on the ballot in three states that basically criminalize whistleblowers who get onto factory farms and take photo and video tape and otherwise document factory farm ab abuses. Fortunately, those ballot measures in all three states were just defeated if, within the last few weeks, but it, uh, the agriculture industry has said it intends to continue to pursue those in other, more, other states where they may be more welcome and more possibly passed. Other campaigns in the states that I've not seen uh, taken up here yet are for downers to ban the use of downers. Downers are cattle and pigs and things that fall down in the process of being herded into the slaughterhouses, into the feed yards and stockyards, and are uh, trampled or otherwise left to die and uh, either dragged away or not and entered into the food process. Usually they're down because they're sick or injured or otherwise pose some kind of food safety threat, so I'm not sure why the producers are so intent in getting them into the, the process, but um, a couple states have now moved to take uh, rule that downers cannot be used in factory farm production, that they must be put out of their misery and, and put out of the way, and that was successful in California, and some other states are looking at it as well. In the U.S., they're also looking at um, phasing out the production of foie gras, which involves uh, force-feeding tubes down geese's necks and feeding them with grain until they get so large they can't move. Um, there's only a few more of those production facilities left in the U.S., and there are efforts to shut them down. And finally, an increase in the truth and labeling over there, uh, an effort I think would have some momentum in Australia as well in terms of um, labeling the source of food products and how, how they are raised and also a movement to uh, get some kind of standard definition for what organic or organically grown means. Thank you, Diana. My next question, and my whole idea of this is to um, hopefully try to elicit some discussion points for the audience to encourage you to ask your questions of the panellists very soon. My question for you, Celeste. Peter mentioned the tough restrictions on trade-related measures imposed by the World Trade Organisation. 
and the belief that the WTO rules make it impossible to raise one's own standards without being vulnerable to lower welfare imports. Are there similar concerns here in respect of WTO trade restrictions, the impact on the industry and improving standards for animal products? Sorry, that's quite a three questions in one. It's a lot. Thanks, Ruth. <laughs> You're welcome. And actually, um, I don't want to go too far into WTO law only because it's really Peter's area of expertise, but I think he made some really important points that we can put into an Australian perspective. And one sort of the, the basic um, argument around um, not wanting to raise standards locally is the, the effect on competition, to say that your local producers will um, be undercut by lower cost producers elsewhere. That could be state to state. It can also be international trade issues. And so you can see from what Lee's, what one of Lee's points was that if a national um, raising of standards would thereby put all producers on the same playing field. If you have differences across states, which is more likely than not in Australia, um, you can have the effect of if one um, jurisdiction, for example, Tasmania raises their standards and the other states don't, that pork producers may just relocate out of that state. And it's not actually fixing the problem, it's just shifting it around. And that can be on an international scale or local. But a couple of the issues are, you would have to first show that the change in welfare standards do significantly affect price. And what Peter was pointing out was the evidence that they put together that a lot of these measures don't significantly affect the price of production and that there really may not be that much to the argument. Now maybe surveys might need to be done in Australia to see if it's the same case here, but it probably is. Um, the other issue is, is whether you really are trade exposed. We hear a lot about trade exposed in the carbon area, which is one of my other fields. Um, emissions intensive trade exposed. Here it's um, animal intensive trade exposed. Are they really trade exposed industries so that it would be problematic to have a different level of standards. I had a bit of a look around. I'm not that good on, on industry statistics, but it does appear that the pork industry is one that does have a significant, there is a significant import of, of meats from overseas. And looking at the, where those products are coming from, they're basically from three countries, from the US, which we've heard um, from Dana, there's been a lot of advances in, in the, the treatment of pigs in the US. Canada, which I'm not too sure about, and Denmark. For some reason, those three countries imp um, export, those three make up like one third each of the pork products that come into Australia, and Denmark is part of the EU. So mm -hmm. there's, that sort of undermines the argument that if we were to raise standards here, that all of the competitors are going to have some sort of um, mm -hmm. advantage over us. So I think, you know, those arguments are easy to make to say, oh, well, we can't raise standards, and, and then if we try to ban imports or put a labeling system in, that that's going to be challenged. But to even look closer at the trade exposed issue is it a real issue. And then also what Peter was mentioning, which you might want to pick up on, is that looking closely at a lot of the decisions, there's more to it than, oh, it's just all too hard. So you mentioned the, the issue of like products. That comes, I think, from the asbestos <coughs> case? Yes. That, at, at asbestos. As, um, bringing out that idea about consumer tastes and preferences being relevant. Um, and um, what was the other one I wanted to mention? Oh, the, um, the, the reliance on the exceptions. One exception that um, even if you're held to violate the basic principles of GATT, that you can make an argument that it's still acceptable because it fits within one of the exceptions. The moral exception hasn't been given a lot of, of um, opportunity to, to really be tested out. Um, in the gambling, there's a gambling case um, where it did seem to be um, put some life back into that argument that to protect the, what the, the local population thinks is right, that that does have value and should be, they should be allowed to control products as well as services. That was a services case, but I might leave it. And if you wanted to follow up on any of that, Peter. Um, yes, I mean, it, it, WTO case law really has has moved over these last 10 years. Uh, the cases don't necessarily always involve animals, but they're, they're cases that are elucidating the principles. So the WTO has several times, the appellate body has several times said when it's looking at the scope of the, the Article 20 exceptions, that WTO members are free to determine what, what level of protection they want in their territory, whether that's, you, you know, on a moral issue or on a health issue, as long as the 
as long as the way the measure is applied does not discriminate as between domestic producers and would-be importers or, or between different would-be importers into the country. <laughs> there was also the really quite remarkable, the, the shrimp turtle case. So, okay, that wasn't about farm animals, it was about an endangered species, but remarkably, uh, in the final kind of round of that case, the appellate body actually said that it, it is perfectly okay for a country to, 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 to condition access to its markets on exporters adopting an environmental programme <coughs> equivalent to their own. And it was partly on that basis that the EU took this extraordinary step of saying, okay, we want meat that comes into the EU to be derived from animals slaughtered to welfare standards equivalent to our own. Something that 10 years ago wouldn't have been... In fact, it, it has been in EU legislation since the early 90s, but nobody had heard of the WTO <laughs> then, so nobody was bothered. <laughs> what was remarkable was that when they updated the regulation with all the fears of WTO, and this was just in 2009, after a lot of debate, getting advice from the Canon Council Legal Services, they said, no, we, we, we believe that if we're challenged, we could we could present a good argument. But like so much of this, it's dependent on all of us, on lawyers, but not just on lawyers, to make a fuss. You know, the only reason the WTO has changed in the last 15 years, because it used to be incredibly inflexible. I mean, the first shrimp turtle decision in 98 was basically saying there is no way that an animal issue, even endangered species, will ever interfere with free trade, to this huge turnaround. So we, we, you know, whether it's a WTO or anything else, we. We need to find ways of making it clear that decision makers know what the public cares about. It's a very important point there, Peter. Um, my question for you this evening is not about, not strictly about WTO. Um, more of a general question. If you could recommend one step that is most crucial for achieving legislative change for the betterment of animal care, what would that be? Really just one. Just one. <laughs> I'm going to cheat. <laughs> uh, the, the, the first thought going from the experience in Europe is you, you, you know, politicians want to know the scientific justification. Not, not unreasonably, perhaps. But they want to protect themselves so that if, if people, you know, if there is a problem, they can turn around and say, well, we, we didn't just listen to the animal welfare NGOs. We relied on, you know, the established scientific uh, literature. But I'm probably over the last five years beginning to shift my thinking, and I suspect it's this field of economics we really need to look at. I remember lobbying in the EU for three years trying to get a decent broilers directive. You know, talking to polit politicians from many of the countries. Nobody ever talked about the science. They always talked about the economics. They always, I mean, always underscoring all this is the WTO, which is, you know, a painfully technical area, but crucial because every time the worry was, yeah, but if we say, you know, broilers have to have more space, then we'll be flooded by imports from Thailand and Brazil or whatever. So we need to learn more about the economics. There's, there's mountains of science about animal behavior, much less about the economics. And it's why I try to sketch in at the end that when you look at these other adverse impacts of, of factory farming, you know, not just the welfare, but the fact that it's a, a massively wasteful use of grain and soy, that it damages the environment, that it damages biodiversity, that it's awful for human health. Um, not only these adverse things, but there is now... The, it's extraordinary. It's not coming from NGOs. It's coming from people like the World Bank. And there was a very big, respectable report done for the UK government earlier this year called the Foresight Report on the Future Farm. They're all using this incredibly kind of wooden expression that we need to internalise the externalities. We need to find ways, most obviously probably through tax, of making sure that if something costs, if, it's a, if there's a damage, um, that there's a way of costing that, because without it, it is what economists call a market failure. So we, we all need to become better economists. <laughs> okay, so your cheating answer was that there's actually two crucial steps. Yes. We need valid, I will throw it in there, independent science, and we need to learn more about the economics involved with yes. improving the conditions of farm animals. Um, now I will open up the panel to all of you. I hope you all have some 
brilliant questions to ask our experts here tonight. Yes. <coughs> We're the um, only country in the world that actually eats its coat of arms. <laughs> we consume our coat of arms in Australia. Oh, we eat the kangaroo sense. and we eat the emu. We also have some other problems compared, say, to where you've been and doing your work in the United States. Ralph Nader once was asked about apathy in Australia and Nader said it's not so much that as that people don't feel they have a sense of individual power. The back streets of Minneapolis, they can quote the Constitution to you. They do draw up, they get on the phone, they get on the emails, they get on their hammer, they get on their case. The second thing is to quote Bob Dylan, who loves touring here, but he said recently, in Australia you always seem to have to ask permission. And there's something that's holding us back, and I wanted to ask you, in view of the fact, this is for Peter, in view of the fact that there was this extraordinary outpouring of horror and outrage when the pictures were revealed about what was happening in Indonesia. And people were in a terrible state about it. Yes, unfortunately, the thing's now closed down again. The Prime Minister has washed her hands in blood and said, that's it. Stunning isn't done necessarily in Australia anyway. We knew that was gone for the moment. What I wanted to ask you was, how do you use that kind of energy in your work to get through to people, as well as the economists, as well as the corporate conscience, how do you actually make people, or not make, how do you bring people to the realisation of being responsible for being part of what's happening? In other words, that that's something they take from the shelf in, in the supermarket, that piece of meat has this history and I'm part of that karma. Um, I, th I think... <laughs> I think it's a really good question, and anybody who quotes Bob Dylan to me, <laughs> it's wonderful. Um, uh, I, I'm sorry, that isn't an easy answer. I mean, tenacity is part of it. Um, you know, because, yes, the, the, the public, you know, we've made a start in Europe, but no more than a start. And, yeah, the public there, too, is often apathetic. You know, not really apathetic, we're all massively too busy nowadays, you, you grab the food off the supermarket shelf. I suppose the phrase only connect, if we could only get people to realise that at that, that point when you pick up the food, something is happening. You know, if you are buying a pack of battery eggs, you are responsible for what's happening. But it's a, it's, a, it's a long process. Any major social change is a long process, but it can happen. I mean, part, sometimes what encourages me is how, you know, looking back over, over, you know, one short lifetime, how much change has been. I remember in the 60s, and I don't know, I don't know if the American television series Mad Men has been mm. yeah. Everybody, and I was part of it, was smoking. Men, women, at home, in bed, at work. I don't know about here, but, you know, in, in much of Europe, smoking just is... Oh, just, oh, so last millennium, nobody, nobody <laughs> smoked. You know, so society's changed, but they don't, you, you know, then, yeah, I'm sorry, I just come back to tenacity. Does honey work better than vinegar? Does enchanting people about the lives and souls of animals make people feel better than waving the finger at them and guilt? I think, I think that's the current wisdom. I, I, I think one needs bits of both. I, I, not making them feel guilty, but people do need to know just, just how awful it is. I suspect most politicians, I, I, I shall exempt the people around this table, you, you know, are actually not aware of what a factory farm's like, not aware of just how awful a typical pig factory farm is. Um, so, yes, there's a huge job in just kind of creating that, that awareness. And I wish I had a magic... <laughs> a magic answer. <laughs> I think Peter is right that it's a bit of both. I've, I still find it extraordinary how many kangaroos we kill. I think it's about 30 million over the last 10 years. And I often thought if Four Corners had did an expose like they did for the cattle, what would have the response would have been? And I think it would have been the same. I still think most Australians do not realise the degree of the slaughter, the numbers, and how it occurs. Can I say... They will, yes. 
Sorry, Peter. Yeah, um, I mean, one point I tried to kind of sketch in really talking about eggs, but I think is crucial, and I think big changes are coming, and I think we're coming here too, is from food businesses, you know, the big retailers, the big food manufacturers, the big food service operators. They, they have, you know, on the plus side, they've got corporate social responsibility, and some of them do take it seriously. On, on the negative side, they don't want to damage their reputations. You know, if, if, if a big supermarket is suddenly shown to be sourcing uh, I mean, suppose, for example, it could be shown that some of the beef from Indonesia actually came back here. Whoever was selling that would, you, you know, would lose an awful lot of reputation. So, so and, and funny enough, there it's been the honey that's worked. Uh, we have quite a big food business team and we've established something called the Good Egg Awards. We reward companies, and they love it, who are absolutely non-cage. You know, there's not just not batter eggs, but not enriched cage eggs. So I think one has to pull all these different levers. Peter, one for you, please. Um, is there any sort of um, uh, compassion fatigue in Europe on, that, on animal rights issues that's come out of the GFC? That's the first question, actually, one that follows that. Um, I gather that in Europe now there's a move towards more carbon um, friendly philosophy, so that, for instance, in the consideration of cage broiler systems, which wouldn't get a look in here, evidently in Europe they are looking at cage broiler production, possibly in Russia, but some of the supermarket chains are considering it, and it's sort of a carbon offset because the <coughs> enclosed system reduces emissions. Those are my two questions. Thank you, Peter. Um, firstly, the the simpler one, if you wish, about compassion fatigue, though, though hard to measure. No, I, do, I don't think there is, but you're right, there is a real danger, and it's up to those of us who care about it to keep finding you know, new ways of, of, of presenting the situation to people. So yes, there's a danger. I think your, your second question, I mean, just on the technical level, actually it would be illegal under the broilers directive to use cages for broilers. Um, it, it doesn't say so in so many words, but the amount of litter that has to be provided under the directive wouldn't make that possible. But, but you're quite right that I believe they are used, you know, cages for the meat chickens in Russia. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think the whole, I, I mean, the whole issue of carbon and the, the impact of different systems on carbon is immensely complex. It, it's not an easy area for those of us who care about welfare because there are, there are some arguments that very intensive systems uh, particularly, you know, the, the pig and poultry systems are less damaging from a climate change point of view. I think that that argument is undermined when one takes proper account. Again, it always comes back to the grain and the soy. You know, the, the amount of carbon that is emitted uh, when you manufacture and then when you apply the synthetic fertilizer that you use to grow the, the, the soy is very considerable. When you, when you cut down swathes of tropical rainforest, not only are you wrecking biodiversity, but as I said, you're releasing stored carbon into the atmosphere, so you're, you know, that's a, again another contribution to climate change. Whereas if you're looking at outdoor systems, you know, particularly pasture-based systems, then actually those produce carbon sequestration, actually store carbon. So it's, it's a complex issue. I think in the UK and Europe, though, it's still one we're having to tackle, because I have heard factory farmers saying, oh no, we're the good guys now, because our, our, our systems actually are less climate change damaging. So it, it, it's a complicated argument. Um, yeah, it, and it probably deserves a whole lecture just of its own. Um, up the back there. Hello. Hello, my questions are directed towards Kate and also to Celeste Black. Kate, you mentioned that we have to look towards the federal system rather than the state system at the moment, considering who's in power. However, my understanding is that at the federal level, we only have a limited opportunity because uh, the Constitution doesn't mention animals. Much of responsibility, responsibility lies at the state level. I mean, we do have, for example, the trade and commerce power and also indirectly through codes. Uh, I guess the question is, what pathways are really available at the federal level and are they truly effective? Yes, I think when I was suggesting at the federal level it, with, with the Greens and the balance of power, just being able to have more influence, say for example, whether it's the on the model codes of practice or whether it's trying to get um, discussions, Senate inquiries, 
um, which you know can be quite beneficial at the federal level. And Lee might want to jump in there as well with the, the federal portfolio. Um, at the state level, I think it's important, even if you know, uh, say for example, a private member's bill on something is is put forward in two years' time or eighteen months' time or whatever. Um, even if that bill fails in terms of um, uh, getting passed, I think it's important to to still you know try in terms of making the the public debate happen. Um, I think public debate and campaigning on animal welfare is obviously a big step in terms of reform and private members' bills and um, parliamentary you know, activities can assist with that campaign. Um, who knows, though, if there was, for example, something in New South Wales to ban sour crates um, sooner, so 2015 or something like that, there was some private members' bill that was put forward. Who knows whether there may be enough uh, community support, community backlash, there could be, you know, a, a documentary combined with a, a cutting edge report, combined with a, amazing petitions, combined with the types of rallies that we saw in Tasmania that led to that, that would place enough pressure on, um, you know, particularly maybe regional members of the coalition. And we did see something that, that brought that forward. So I wouldn't, wouldn't say it's impossible, but I would have to say it'd have to be something that was quite achievable you know, knowing, for example, in relation to sow stalls and, and nothing, nothing too, um, too ambitious or radical in the next four years, and I would say potentially eight years, um, given the Shooters and Fishers Party's relationship um, with the coalition. And, and also given what I have to say is a, is a pretty conservative bunch of, uh, of coalition members in the upper house. It's difficult to get them to agree that climate change is real, actually. Uh, let alone, you know, significant animal welfare reform at the moment. So it, it's, it's um, on the positive side though, because that sounds really depressing, but on the positive side, I don't think the reform would have happened anyway in state parliament at this point in time. And the real reform, as we've talked about on this panel, is happening um, with retailers, happening with, you know, members of the community, driving petitions, happening at the international level as well. And I think, to be honest, the state government is probably going to be the last one that, that moves and we'll find half of the major pig producers and others moving, for example, to ban South stores before the New South Wales government does. And again, it's, it's because of, um, you know, members of the public, um, money, um, driving it. I might just mention there is a body called Animal Health Australia. It's an initiative of federal, state, territory governments and the livestock industry about looking at um, bringing uniformity to the various codes. So on one level that can sound healthy, but there um, can be a real downside that we've seen in other um, examples when you have COAG, where you have the state and Commonwealth governments coming together in a whole range of aspects of our lives uh, to bring uniformity and it's dressed up in a very fancy way. But what you often see is it's taken down to the lowest common denominator. So rather than improving the system, it can often be locked down and can actually make it even more challenging for us. But having said that, I think it needs to be noted it's an avenue where we need to engage and put the pressure on, but it's certainly one to watch. I'll just comment just quickly, because I know we're starting to run out of time. I think the Animal Health Australia is part of the Australian Animal Welfare Strategy that was started and seems to have kind of stalled, I think, the Oz um, whole process. I think there were some good ideas there about trying to achieve uniformity in, in actually getting real buy-in to the development of the code so that if a model code was agreed upon um, by the ministers, that it would be adopted across the states equally and not have all the, the variations that we sometimes do have. But the point's well taken that sometimes the uniformity just goes, goes down, down to the lowest standard rather than raising the others up. And I think perhaps the, the, the way we've seen perhaps more national um, uh, sort of uh, drivers is, is through retail, is through <laughs> the consumers and through the large national food chains saying that we're going to be quite clear about um, process for products that we're putting on our shelves and also for some of the producers to see a commercial angle there for product differentiation, to say that this is a better product because it's produced in a more natural <coughs> environment and, they, and just testing that market out. And we can, we've seen with the, with the eggs how 
the free-range egg market has just taken off, and it had, didn't have to be forced, but that consumer uptake has been quite significant. We're starting to see free-range pork, or is it bread free-range? And one of the issues is what do those things mean anyway, and who decides what they mean, but that's another issue as well. <laughs> I, and what, what perplexes me is the uh, notion of enforcement, and this is really to you, Peter. You know, all these uh, changes, and I can't remember them in detail, uh, that, are take, that have taken effect with the sow stalls and the veal crates and so on, um, over a period of time, and those that are coming up in 2013 and 2012, which is, you know, in six months' time, which police force, who is going to go around and say, uh, you have got veal crates and uh, now there is a penalty of X number of dollars or a jail sentence, who, uh, how, how is it going to be enforced in, in practical, everyday, you know, detailed terms? Um. <clears throat> Enforcement, really, yeah, you're quite right, is a major issue. You know, once one's got a good new law, then as animal welfare organisations, we have to put just as much energy into getting it enforced. Uh, we have some major enforcement problems in Europe. Um, I spend far too much of my time, you know, writing complaints, either to the member states or to the European Commission. For example, the material you saw on the fattening pigs was taken in about five or six different EU countries, including Denmark, you know, from an investigation we did, where we just went on to about 70 farms in different countries, mm -hmm. and then have to kind of, you know, write and say, look, this is the law you've broken, what are you going to do about it? If they don't do anything about it, you can take it to the European Commission. But can you say, did the police, call the police, um, you, you, you probably could in some countries. The way EU law works is that once the law is made, it's up to each individual member state to enforce it. Though the Commission has an overriding responsibility to make sure the member states are doing it properly. But um, again, I'm afraid that the, the, the broad answer is, no, if, if we don't make a fuss, we the NGOs, we the people who care, then it probably won't be enforced. We have to, you know... Uh, uh, we've just, with two other organisations, done a big investigation into EU animals being exported to Turkey, which is not, I mean, nothing as bad as Indonesia, but nonetheless pretty bad. And on, on my days off, I, I've been granted two days off, uh, I, I shall be spending most of those poring over all the information we got, writing complaints to the member states involved and then to the Commission. So, so you know, that is where we as lawyers really are important. We're important in two ways, partly because of the things we can do, like making you know, prosecutions or complaints or helping with the form formulation of legislation, but perhaps even more important because lawyers are you know, a respected traditional profession. If lawyers are saying, this is wrong, this is immoral, this is cruel, it's actually quite potent. Mm -hmm. Okay, we are running short on time. We'll have, we'll have two more questions, and I'm sorry I've already been instructed on who they will be. Um, yeah. The person at the back with the mic. Yeah. I can't see. Yes, My please. question to the politicians is, it was about ORS, what's happened to ORS? Has it fallen apart? And if it has, because it was such a great initiative, the Australian Animal Welfare Strategy, um, if it has fallen apart, uh, is the government funding the various animal welfare units um, well enough? Uh, that you're giving enough funding because I believe in New South Wales that it has been less and less funded over the years, the animal welfare unit. So are we funding these people be uh, well enough and the animal welfare science centres that do so much work on animal welfare, are they well enough funded? Are we putting enough funding into those areas so that we do have the scientific background um, to pass the legislation? Is the animal welfare strategy at the I, I federal the level? Part, mm. Maybe you know more about. Can you just actually hear the first part of the question? I think the first part of your question was about the um, if the animal welfare strategy has been kind of ignored or, or dropped or something. Is that was that the very first part of your question? Then what happens with the animal welfare units and is it being resourced adequately? 
Do you want to go? I can go, I can go at the state level uh, a little bit in terms of um, animal welfare resources. And of course the answer is no. There aren't uh, enough resources whatsoever um, to police. Not only we're talking obviously with the RSPCA, they're the, um, I think, um, did you mention that, Dana, the RSPCA? Yeah. Yes. Um, they're the ones that obviously are called if, if um, there's any cruelty or whatever, and the, the um, police, for example, excuse, have, have excuse no role. Me, I was talking about the animal welfare unit within the government. Federal government or state? State. So, yeah. Your, your animal welfare unit is yes. part of the department. In, yeah, I was getting uh, that. Yes, yeah. sorry. I was just wasn't talking about the RSPCA. I'm just talking about the various animal welfare units within the government departments. Yeah that um, have been around for a long time. Um, how well funded are they? Um, are they funded well enough to produce this background information that you need to pass the various legislation? So I don't know the specifics of how many um, people or how much money uh, is um, in those animal welfare, the animal welfare unit within the Department of Primary Industries. Um, I do know that we were, uh, when I first got the portfolio um, late last year, um, when I approached the Minister for Primary Industries to talk to them about animal welfare, there was one person, a woman, who um, uh, was could talk to us about the uh, about animal welfare within the Department of Primary Industries. I'm sure there is more than that. It's something I'm um, wanting to follow up with the, the next round of budget estimates questions to see whether there have been reductions. So I can't answer your question in terms of specifics. All I can say is that obviously there needs to be more resources in it and that it's, it's like the um, fox in charge of the hen house, of course, having animal welfare uh, as part of um, Department of Primary Industries. I know that there have been some people advocating for that to at least be uh, transferred over to what is now the Office of Environment and Heritage. Um, so that's a problem in itself. So I'd say inadequately resourced, can't give you the figures, um, but also it's positioned um, incorrectly. <laughs> and the last question. Deidre. Thank you very much, Peter, and also Dana, for most interesting talks, most informative. Um, Peter, you mentioned this, and I'll quote it, but uh, the politicians may also want to have something to say. Um, you mentioned that politicians will act um, when there's three conditions, that it's based on new legislation, proposals based on sound science, uh, that it won't lead to an increase in costs, that's where the economists come in, and is viable. Um, they're obviously um, criteria that are based on expert opinion. I'm wondering what your view and the politicians' view is on the role of public opinion and public mobilisation is around issues of animal welfare. And um, it sounds like it would be an obvious answer, but given our experience with the live cattle export when public opinion was completely ignored, um, now cattle are being exported to be slaughtered without stunning and there seems to be no consequence to that. So what is the role of the public in an increasing uh, decision making process based on experts? Right, I should have actually, you're quite right, I should have amongst those, those, those important criteria included public opinion. Of course politicians want to know that what they are considering doing, you know, enjoys widespread public support. So yeah, I, I shall add that into <laughs> the speech of public opinion. It really is frustrating though, isn't it, when there's that clear evidence of immensely cruel treatment in Indonesia and it's just ignored by the government. And again, one of the challenges, and like with all these things, there are, are not easy answers, like your question about enforcement, is yeah, you know, how to keep something going. Industry is very good at kind of riding the storm, you know, so there's some big scandal about something. Um, and they know that as time goes by, people, you know, forget about it, Every, you know, people's <coughs> attention goes elsewhere, politicians' attention goes. So the, the, part of the challenge is to keep, to keep that up. Uh, and certainly in, in, in much of Europe, politicians say, you know, what, one, of the, one of the things I get more letters about or nowadays emails about is animal welfare. They know there is a lot of concern and I think it's up to Australians to make it clear at both federal and state level to their politicians that the, the resumption of live exports is 
That's, that's, that's not a scandal. Um, I mean, it's, I, you know, it's not just Indonesia. I've worked in this field mm. for 20 years, and you know, for 20 years, I've known about the, the appalling treatment of animals, Australian animals in the Middle East, which, which is really only, only one step less bad than what goes on in Indonesia. I mean, having been in the Middle Eastern slaughterhouses, they are just. You know, it's not that people are cruel, but that there is no skill, there's no infrastructure. And this is one thing that we, all of us, need to... Because, you know, slaughter in most countries is probably like it is in Indonesia. This is not exceptional. We need to find ways of really transmitting the, the knowledge that's there in, in developed countries to these countries. I actually was in a slaughterhouse in the Middle East, a brand new one three years ago, not even yet animals in, where... The, the, the passageway from the unloading to the killing point for cattle went through a right-angled bend. It would have been just as cheap to build a curve, but the person designing it didn't know that cattle won't go through a right angle. Then you've built cruelty into your infrastructure, because then you will have to beat the animals, you have to use an electric goad, because they're not going to go through a right-angled bend of their own volition. So some of it's as simple as that. Uh, just well, in relation to public public opinion, like it, it, it's absolutely front and centre, of course, of, of what politicians respond to. And I don't be, I know that the, the back down on the live export um, is really shocking and distressing, but don't underestimate the power of um, the response to Four Corners and the ongoing influence of um, people's response and the ongoing, uh, how that has influenced people, you know, how it's turned, you know, probably given us a whole new generation of people fighting for animal rights. Like, it's been, it's been really, really powerful. And I, I think that's... The government knows that that's really unpopular. The media's reporting on it. You know, it, it, we know that that was a catalyst for change. And I think... I don't think that decision's happened and that's it. You know, that it's just a, a step in the, in the process. But, I, yeah, I think, it, as we all do, I personally didn't watch it because I just couldn't watch it. And I, you know, have seen the images flashed up, unfortunately, on everything. Uh, but, you know, incredible. So, absolutely, public opinion, we, did, we need to keep, keep that up. And don't think that, um, you know, just the Four Corners program will continue to mobilise people. Obviously, organisations like Voiceless are absolutely crucial in, in the great work that they do. I think what's worth remembering with public opinion too, as Kate so clearly identified, it's incredibly important, but for, for a lot of the time, we, we often don't feel as though we're getting somewhere, but we really are. It's just that it, you, you build up, you build up, and then you do have the breakthrough. And in my mind, history shows us that in different areas where our life has improved. And now, as Voiceless has so beautifully said, the 21st century is the time for animal rights, and, and that is the movement of this time. But I think often, because human beings, we think quite short term, but seriously, I couldn't give you an uh, emphasise more strongly how politicians, when they're getting the emails and they're getting the phone calls and they're starting to get a lot of them, they'll pat down the corridor or they'll sit in Parliament and say, are you getting a lot of those messages? What's going on? And they really do have an impact. Like, never underestimate your signature on a petition, those letters, the emails. Pick up the phone and phone, phone your MP. It is really, really worth it. And the live export that Labor members of the Labor caucus not only spoke out in caucus but spoke outside of caucus rarely happens. They just don't break ranks. They did this time, they did it because people spoke out. That gave them strength and that's what we need. And can I say, Lee would agree with this, animal lovers are the most full-on activists. Yes. <laughs> like you got, like in terms of lobbying, yeah, totally. really, like yeah. hundreds of thousands. Like it, it is, it is incredible how it's many wonderful. emails on any issue you get, whether it's flying foxes, you know, yeah. grey nose sharks, um, hunting in national yeah. parks, yeah. cats. Mm. You, you blitz it really. So mm. keep that up. That's good. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much to all of our panelists this evening. I think the three main messages there are: it's not just for the lawmakers. It's not just for the politicians, it's for everybody to stand up and shout their disappointment as to the way that farm animals are produced in this country.